All right, we should get started. So uh, this is our Spheres discussion group, Spheres reading group, our third uh, meeting. And we're discussing chapter two on um, between faces. And I thought that um, unlike in the previous two calls, maybe we, I could suggest a, a kind of overarching format for, for the discussion. Uh, to uh, ground it a little bit more in uh, the text itself and get us on the on the same page uh, before we move into other directions, associations we may have, personal reflections, and so on. Uh, and so, what I would suggest is that we begin as before with John, you giving uh, your overview or introduction uh, to the chapter, but then we go from there to really get on the same page as a group in terms of what we understand Sloterdijk to be saying in the pages, in the text itself. Uh, uh, Ed had made the suggestion in the form, and I think, it was a, I think it was a good one. And then from there, once we have that resonance and that mutual understanding, to whatever degree we can achieve that in a, maybe half the time we have or a third of the time that we have, move on to our personal reactions or interpretations or to other forms of meaning making, which you know, could be emergent. Um, but that first we'd start just by you know making sure we understand the text uh what however we un understand that uh whatever we understand that to be uh so uh with that said i would invite you to john to uh, get us started and then we can move into the discussion uh we've all by the way also already know each other we've introduced ourselves so we don't have to do that uh, anybody who's watching this for the first time can go back to our previous discussions to uh learn more about ourselves and about us individually so let's jump into it, uh, shall we? Go for it. Okay. Um, I think that um, the first point worth noting as a kind of a footnote is that um, I don't think this chapter would exist without uh, Deleuze and Guattari's chapter in A Thousand Plateaus on faciality. I think that this chapter is very much a conscious response to that chapter in A Thousand Plateaus and even refers to them in this chapter. So we know that there's, there's a concrete relationship in the chapter on faciality, uh, it's called Year Zero Faciality. Uh, simply, it follows their chapter on what they call these different sign regimes. And a sign regime for Deleuze and Guattari is a, a, uh, a system of signifiers. Uh, it's, a, it's a fancy French POMO term for basically something that might be equivalent to Gebser's consciousness structures. Uh, the French translation of that is sign regimes. Each consciousness structure has its own, <coughs> its own sign regime. Um, and there are three different kinds of faciality that they mention. Uh, and it's just worth having a little background here as, as we come into this chapter. Um, three different sign regimes. Um, they've got four primary sign regimes, but three of them are associated with faciality. And the first is the pre-signifying sign regime. This corresponds more or less to Gebser's magical consciousness structure. It has to do with the tribal world. And in the tribal world, the faciality is hidden by the mask. The mask hides the face and the mask substitutes as a signifier for the face. Um, and that is the faciality that we find associated with the pre-signifying uh, regime. The signifying regime proper is what they call the despotic regime, which comes in with the rise of the Bronze Age despot, great god ruler, in which um, the visage is represented as a, a god-king countenance with the light of the other world shining through that countenance. Uh, and it can cause paranoia. The despot is <clears throat> frequently paranoid. Um, it's a sort of paranoid sign regime. Uh, that sign regime goes all the way down. You can trace it all the way down to Byzantine art, uh, which has a, a bit of influence on this, on Sloterdijk's discussion as well. Uh, and then the third sign regime that has a faciality assigned to it is simply that of the he what they call the Hebrew passional or post-signifying sign regime, which is based on a mode of betrayal. And so the face is turned into profile. It's turned away uh, in a mode of betrayal that's, goes all the way down to the psychoanalyst couch with Freud where you don't face the uh, classic treatment as you, the, you're facing away from the patient. That sign regime goes all the way down to that with that kind of faciality turned away from the God as Moses must turn away from the apparition of the divine and not see it. Otherwise, he's blasted by the countenance of the radiance. So there's, there's that. Uh, as a kind of archaeology of the chapter, there's, there's, these ideas are worth thinking about as you read through the chapter, and as we begin the chapter and move into it, Sloterdijk starts by referring back to the discussion between Lysias and Phaedrus, uh, where they see they're beholding each other's countenance, 
And the countenance is one that is informed by the platonic idea of the light from another world. The faciality is, um, in the platonic sense, uh, is connected to the ideality of the realm of the forms and the ideas uh, in an almost neoplatonic sense where the light from another world shines through the visage. And the beauty of the beautiful visage is meant to remind one of the soul, the soul's original experience of beautiful forms in the between life world, the, the world between lives. Um, and so beauty uh, experienced through the visage is a memory of that world. So Slaughter Dyke begins his sort of archaeological history of faciality confined primarily to Northwestern Europe with that, and then moves into a discussion of Giotto's, a couple of paintings from Giotto's Arena Chapel, dating from about 1306, uh, where he begins to talk about uh, the relationship between, in one of the paintings, between Joachim and St. Anne. Uh, Joachim has been exiled from the city, and he is returning to greet St. Anne, and these are the parents of Mary. And uh, he points out that in the image, you can see the two halos of Joachim and Anne merging together almost to form a single bubble. So Giotto gives us a good concrete image of a microsphere, an intimate, uh, dyadic, biune microsphere that is achieved through faciality or interfaciality, as the term that Slaughterdyke uses, uh, in this image. And it's a beautiful image that forms uh, where Joachim is kissing Anne and the two together form a third face. And you can see the third face looks almost like a Picasso face. If you look at it, he gives a close-up to, uh, to where you can see this third face emerging uh, in a ghostly manner between them, giving a sense of the interlocking of, uh, of an intimate uh, biune interfacial microsphere. Then he contrasts this with another painting uh, that is the opposite of this, uh, which, which is Judas kissing Christ in the mode of betrayal, which is interesting because we remember the mode of betrayal uh, is part of the Hebrew passional uh, post-signifying sign regime in DNG. So that sign regime has survived along with the Byzantine despotic sign regime. There's a mixed regime here present in these images in a wonderful way. The West gradually has to shed this Byzantine influence. But we see the visages in this uh, painting of the Judas kiss and the rupture of the microsphere. Christ is the Pantocrator, the world, the sphere-forming world god man who has the power to form intimate spheres both macrospheric and microspheric and here he is the god man uh condescending to kiss uh judas who he already knows will betray him and judas is represented in a kind of the kind of animal-like physiognomy uh of acquisitiveness and greed and he's outside the the microsphere that uh what christ would otherwise have formed with him or his disciples and so we get this contrast then what Slaughterdyke does is he moves on into a discussion of the evolution of, of faciality in Northwest European art, but he mentions this idea that Byzantine art has a very strong influence, and in what I've called in my book Art After Metaphysics, the influence of Byzantine art on Western art, uh, Northwestern European art, took a while to shake off, and its influence consisted in the creation of, of what I termed in that book iconotypes. I couldn't find a term for it elsewhere. So I simply term them iconotypes, and iconotypes are repetitive, uh, typical representations of the Last Supper, uh, the ascension of Mary to heaven, the crucifixion, the beheading of John the Baptist. These are all iconotypes, and Byzantine art is made up exclusively of iconotypes, and so it's exclusively a kind of Neoplatonic art of the light of the other world shining down into this one. It emphasizes eternity, not temporality. Uh, So we have this iconotypical influence as Western art gets going, and Giotto is normally quoted as being this this sort of first great Western painter. You can already see it disintegrating, though. The gold dome of the heavens in Byzantine art disintegrates to the blue sky of Giotto. He's the first to start painting the sky blue. Um, And so you can already see it starting to disintegrate. The iconotypes are shed, and as they are shed, a new, what I actually simply say, a new iconotype comes into being, and that is the portrait study. Uh, The portrait study begins to come into being with the Renaissance, in which the individual is represented now as a singularity. The individual is represented as a rupture with the light from the other world um, that is no longer emphasized as an eternal light, uh, plugging him into an eternal iconotype. The iconotype is shed, and the individual emerges, arises, opens, and emerges as a metaphysical manifestation unto himself or herself. The individual now is himself 
a metaphysical revelation of uniqueness, a revelation of a singularity that the portrait artist now captures as an evanescent image moving through uh, temporality. So the emphasis begins to shift from the Neoplatonic realm, uh, which inspired the Renaissance and got it going with Marcello de Ficino and so forth, to the realm of the temporal, the mundane, the banal. Then we begin, begin to get the expansion in Dutch art of the other iconotypes. And the primary iconotypes that replace the typical iconotypes of Mary and the crucifixion and so forth are the portrait study, the still life, and the landscape painting. Those are the three genres or the three iconotypes, if you want to use, apply that term to this category, um, that now begin to emerge as revelations of a Western metaphysical universe that lights up. And it is thoroughly metaphysical. The art is deceptively realistic. It's not a realistic art at all. It's purely and thoroughly metaphysical. And it's filled with a revelation of the discovery of infinite space as the spheres, the macrospheres collapse and infinite space opens up and the iconotypical kind of microspheres collapse and the individual emerges now in relationship to this new optical horizon of the subject's point of view gazing out into the infinite. And so there's an interrelationship now between the microsphere of the individual and the macrosphere of infinite space that now replaces the gold-closed cavern dome of the Byzantine world. And so Sloterdijk discusses this for a while and chews on it uh, in his wonderful fashion. He's very good at chewing scenes, as, as we would say in acting, and uh, eventually traces this down to the rise of uh, modernist art, where he says that with modernist art, the portrait is done away with uh, by the detrit. One other thing I forgot to mention uh, that seeks into this is his concept of protraction. Now, protraction is something that um, has both a biological and a cultural basis. And he says that the biological basis of protraction is simply the sexual selection process that has resulted throughout the harmonization process of selecting beautiful faces and wanting to sexually reproduce those faces. And so there's an aesthetic dimension to Homo sapiens sapiens that is missing with animals. There's an aesthetic drive that supplements the Darwinian uh, fitness principle with an aesthetic principle, wanting to reproduce beautiful visages. And so there's a protraction or an extraction of the human from the animal. Uh, in DNG's chapter, this would be called uh, the process of... Uh, uh, the process of deterritorialization, where they say that the the face is the deterritorialized animal snout, just as the hand is a deterritorialized paw, and the tool that it holds is a deterritorialized branch. And so he's sort of adapting some of the terminology and ideas here from DNG as he moves then finally into a discussion of the rise of the detrate in modernist art, and the detrate replaces the portrait. So the protraction process now. Uh, is no longer the relationship of the human to other humans. It's, we're living in an age now slowly of the relationship of the human to the inhuman, what Thomas Pynchon calls wonderfully in his novel the, uh, the inanimate or the human. Uh, the relationship more and more of the human visage is to closed feedback loops with cameras and machines. And Sloterdijk mentions this as part of the basis for the rise of the detrate, where the facial codes are scrambled. And this, again, is Sloterdijk uh, re-territorializing DNG's concept of uh, defacialization from that chapter, um, where the facial codes are scrambled. They're scrambled, and this becomes especially evident in the art of Francis Bacon. And I think Bacon was the best at doing this, of taking a face and simply making a scrambled egg mess out of it uh, so that it becomes a sort of meaningless sense of something that has been deterritorialized off the plane of significance into an asignifying plane where there is no meaning to the face and no codes can be ascribed to it. It becomes now a new kind of slate. It's as though Bacon were taking the face with an eraser on a chalkboard and wiping it clean so that then new codes can then come along to be ascribed to a new form of faciality, which is perhaps still yet to emerge and is slowly emerging as the human canvas of the face is a blank slate upon which new codes will be inscribed. And so uh, with that little synopsis, I'll turn it over to you guys. <coughs> Well, I would suggest we uh, dig further into the chapter and maybe bring out some other elements uh, which um, uh, or further details to, to the overview that, that you just provided, John. Uh, for example, uh, one area that I'd be interested in exploring a bit 
is the role of the mother and the role of the, the mother-child relationship or, or the mother-child primary or primordial faciality and what value or importance that Sloterdijk uh, gives to this relationship in the larger scheme of his you know, spherology. Um, it seems that part of what he's trying to do is to recover uh, those primary uh, experiences or those primary uh, spaces uh, and to, I would say, uh, perhaps reintegrate them in our conception of you know, who we are as, you know, as, as beings uh, insofar as part of what he's trying to establish is that the face doesn't arise individual. It doesn't, it doesn't at first arise as an individual. It arises as a space of interfaciality and in the first instance, one that is not a signifying or a semantic faciality, but one that he, he, he talks about as a radiant. So the, the mother and child beam at each other, and the, the attractiveness of each to the other is very important. And what seems to happen in the course of you know, that primary sphere expanding um, or differentiating into multiple spheres is that, uh, is that there's a loss, perhaps, of, of, the, of, of a... Of, of a sense of or an intimacy uh, with that prim primary space. And that has all kinds of repercussions and implications in, in our lived experience. So I'd be, I'd be interested in uh, opening up, uh, you know, that question or any others that arise uh, within the, the arc that you've described. And I'd just open it up to anyone to, to chime in on that. Well, <clears throat> I don't know where to begin. That this is really fascinating. Um, you know, I've been reading a lot on the CIA and psychic spying, and one of the things they do when they train CIA uh, psychic spies, they, it's required reading Betty Edwards' book, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, and um, I think that's very curious. But it's very important that they know the difference between a received image and a constructed image. This is pretty crucial if you want to be a psychic spy. You want to know the difference between making up something and actually receiving a direct hit. And that's the way I find myself reading this book. It's, um, I'm relying a lot on a kind of somatic intelligence um, that just receives um, certain images and I also am aware that I'm constructing images as I go along. I know this is probably a little weird, but I had an experience once as I was shaving in the mirror. Um, and, you know, if you guys shave in the mirror, it's a pretty, sometimes a boring task. It is for me, at least. And I find my mind sort of drifting to other kinds of uh, experiences. And one day I was looking at my face in the mirror, and as I shaved, I recalled a very, I got a very strong feeling of Norton, who was a pit bull dog who lived in my neighborhood, who belonged to a very close friend of mine, whom I hadn't seen in a very long time. So I got this real direct hit of this, this feeling of, of Norton, this pit bull dog. And I hadn't seen my friend Ed in a long time who owned the dog or who was a, a companion of the dog. And then all of a sudden, walking down the street, I saw Ed, hadn't seen him in a long time. I said, how's it going? And he said, Norton died. I had to put him down two days ago. This is the day that I was shaving my face and got this strong hit. And then I realized, I sort of put it all together that, oh, that wasn't just a confused kind of something I was making up, but I was receiving something um, about this particular dog, this person who was in a strong relationship with this dog and who was in a strong relationship with me. And Ed said that, you know, Norton, his dog, had ascended to dog heaven or whatever. So I'm just playing with this because I believe these, um, for me, reading this particular chapter is like moving from one room of a gallery to another room in another gallery with this very intelligent, um, tour guide who's just pointing out certain features of the, of the paintings and sort of creating little stories and vignettes around them. 
And I think it's very important as we go from room to room in a gallery that we register the effects of the room we're leaving and the room that we're going into. Because it's in that in between those two uh, different kinds of psychoactive spaces that I think um, all kinds of intuitive hits occur. If we're sensitive to that transition from room to room, most of us are not. We're not, we're pretty mindless about that. So I'm just offering that because to me, I, I remember Nabokov said when he reads, he reads with his spine. And I thought, what the fuck is he talking about reading with his spine? But I think I start to understand he's talking about reading with his somatic intelligence. And it's that somatic intelligence combined with our cognitive that I believe can register the effects of the field uh, in, in, I think, unique and creative ways. So that's how I'm reading this book. And when I read it this way, I sort of enjoy it in a way that I wouldn't if I was just trying to cognitively figure out what is this guy, what is this guy up to? Um, because I think he writes in a you're not going to find anything too syst systematic or logical arguments being offered. I think he's writing in a very um, deductive kind of way. He's really uh, using a lot of analogy and story. And I find it fun. So that's why I'm at right now. Thank you. Well, um, I find it kind of interesting. Uh, he was uh, talking about... I guess he references Deleuze and Guattari on um, the idea that, uh, uh, that like, Deleuze and Guattari say that, that, that all the, that faciality is a European phenomenon, that, that all faciality is the face of Christ. Or anything. And, he, and he, I think he disagrees with it. Um, you know, I forget exactly what, I'm trying to find exactly what, what uh, he says about that. But, only he contrasts, but then he contrasts the face of Christ with the face of Buddha and uh, in, in terms of the uh, suffering of Christ and, and then the sort of serenity of, of the face of the Buddha and, and, and the, and the sort of um, the stance that each, ha each has towards suffering and uh, let's see if I can dig it up here somewhere. Um, yeah. This is unlike the face of Christ, which aims either for final suffering or for the represent, representation of transcendence. Buddha's face shows the uh, pure potential of an absolutely imminent attachability by whatever comes before it. By floating in a, in a state of readiness to resonate, this face is itself uh, the realization of the gospel. It announces n nothing, rather showing what, uh, what is already there. As an expressive manifestation of euphoric emptiness, the countenance of the awakened one in contemplation is the opposite of the character uh, heads of, of Western Caesars modeled by violence and marked by determination. Which I guess is uh, of, of the other thing is talked about, about the Roman Trinity of uh, Caesar, Augustus, and the Roman Empire. I don't know. I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but it, but it, it, it's it, it's interesting way he curates these uh, these different modes of faciality within different cultures and and what they express. So I I first want to thank John for that uh, introduction. That was great, very much so. And uh, the philosopher in me is very curious about uh, Sloterdijk's um, use of history. So uh, I'm not clear about exactly um, what his, what the, what form of genealogy he's enacting here. I think there's some form of genealogical analysis that brings us to the present. And I'll just, and I think Marco was alluding to something of this. Let's just put that to the side. The art historian in me is fascinated by this analysis of late medieval and Renaissance art. And I would just add quickly that, um, in the Renaissance, the emergence of individuals, uh, I would speak of it in terms of Heidegger's notion of a subject, the self as a subject. And that word is first used in the 14th century in, a, in that sense. Um, there are hybrids there too. The individuality is now self, not self-contained as it might start to appear more in the, uh, the Dutch period and so on. And there are hybrids of these unique selves or singularities in the paintings and this openness to receiving something from above 
and in these Renaissance paintings, the negotiation between this new, more individuated, singular human being and the sense of a, of, um, a unique interiority in part is combined with an older sense of inward and upward towards God in a receptive mode. And you get these fantastic hybrids. And uh, just if anyone's interested, um, uh, I wrote a paper many years ago out of my dissertation on how this operates in Raphael and the emergence of artists as a special kind of creator. And it's a very distinctive form of self-portraiture uh, that links to um, these kinds of themes, which are fundamentally metaphysical. So I'm fascinated by this, this whole genealogy. And my question would be, what, what's the purpose of this? What, what is the health and unhealth, if that is the, uh, the value scheme of writing this? What needs to be, what, what's our thrownness? What's the significance of our thrownness? And as this genealogy discloses faciality and other aspects, uh, what needs to be championed, strengthened, and what needs to be discarded and recovered? So, well, when I, um, when I saw him talking about the sort of shift from the sort of platonic Byzantine mode of art to the sort of Western mode of art, which depicts scenes that are half unfolding in time, I, I was actually reminded a little bit of Gebser. Um, and for, for Gebser, it's still a very sort of linear, I, it's, prob, it's still not what Gebser would sort of call the sort of eru eruption of time consciousness or the, the integral mode of consciousness, but it, but it is an interesting mode from the sort of, uh, as John said, from the, from the eternal to the temporal, which, um, and which I think speaks of a kind of um, imminence of, of of divinity and uh, a, a sort of panentheism in uh, in, in artwork, uh, which uh, it's, which is interesting. Um, reminds me of a, a thing, change that happened in the Catholic Church in, with Vatican II, because uh, prior to Vatican II, uh, when the priest is blessing the Eucharist, he would fa he would face away from the congregation toward the altar. Was it? Uh, but Vatican II introduced a change where you would face toward the congregation and break the bread, which uh, to me emphasizes a, a kind of panentheism where where God is in the congregation and he's, saying, he's, seeing, he's right, acknowledging God in the church, which, which I think is, an, is another interesting sort of uh, interfaciality to contemplate. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm drawn to to jump in here and comment to say that uh, I I was I was kind of drawn to different things in the chapter um, and and in keeping with Marco's original suggestion to kind of focus at first on sort of trying to just parse out what I understood from the chapter. <coughs> I, uh, I'm drawn to a passage that I'm going to quickly read that um, that to me was at the heart of what I what I got from it. Um, and this is on page 100. Um, where uh, Sloterdijk is talking about basically making the point um, to paraphrase what John Ebert said earlier that the, uh, or someone said earlier, I don't know if it was John, but th that the initial inter th that interfacial encounter is the initial, the sort of primary uh, source of things. And, and the passage uh, says in the initial bipolar interfacial game, the gazes are distributed among the partners in such a way that each for the time being learns enough about himself by looking into the face of the other who is looking at him. The other thus acts as a personal mirror, but he is also the opposite of a mirror, for he permits neither the peace nor the discretion of a reflection in glass or metal, but above all, because he produces not only an eidetic reproduction, but rather an effective echo. Um, and I, I just found that really important and, the thing that this this whole chapter you know sp spoke to me was um the di the dialogic philosophers uh Le Levinas and Martin Buber uh, and I know Slurdeg mentions Levinas in passing but um to me there is the real you know the insight that that I think Levinas and Buber brought also in my understanding especially Levinas in direct response to Heidegger is that is that that experience of of interfaciality is maybe a, a subset of, or, or a different way of getting at, you know, the encounter with the other, with the capital O is the primary source of, of identity, certainly, and certainly, and the primary source of sort of uh, 
the, the thrust to being in the world. And, and I, I, I could be wrong here because I'm not an expert on these guys, but my understanding is that we can read this idea of the encounter with the other as a sort of totalizing pull into being sort of interpolation or um, throw, being not necessarily thrownness, but being pulled into being by virtue of that responsiveness to the other. Um, and I, I certainly saw a lot of stuff in this chapter that pulled, pulled me into that. And um, I guess my understanding of what Sloterdijk was going for here is it, I think aligned with, with that sort of perspective that we are um, first and foremost sort of pulled into being with the other, but in a way that destabilizes us, which I, I think is another insight of, of the dialogic philosophers and, and of that passage I read where in, in truly looking into the other as a, as a mirror or a mirror and opposite of mirror, it, it's a, it's a destabilizing as well as stabilizing move kind of at the same time, because unlike looking in a, in a glass or metal mirror, um, the other does not reflect us in the sense that it complete it, it both completes us and leaves the space open, leaves the incomplete or creates the incompleteness that pulls us forward. Um, which again, I, I could go into a, a whole bunch of stuff. I think that's the pattern of communicative meaning making at a broader level. That's I think really important. And this is important to note here is that, you know, one, one way to think about what communication is and what the inter subjective or inter uh, inter the communicative processes between people interpersonal is that we are um, by by speaking by by having this this back and forth exchange we're actually creating both the completeness and the incompleteness that drives us to make the next move or to feel the incompleteness that we must that we're compelled to fill with our attempts to to move forward um, and anyway I guess I, I don't I feel like maybe I'm diverging a bit from the chapter or getting more into my own interpretation here but but that was what really stood out to me the I think the art history stuff is interesting, but I found myself really frustrated the first third of the chapter or whatever, which to me felt purely like, like, you know, sort of um, literary criticism or artistic kind of interpretation. And it was only in the second part of the chapter where he started really talking about these different modes of interfacial stuff and, and sort of the dynamics at play that I really got hooked in. Um, but anyway, I think I, I, th I was surprised that there wasn't more of a connection made to to these notions of dialogic kind of, you know, engagement. And I think that maybe has more to do with Sloterdijk's mode of, of, of exploring things through art and through kind of literature than, and not being as literal or not being as direct with his perspective. But anyway, I, I guess that's, I'll stop there. Can I chime in or does someone else want to speak right now? Can I just respond? Um, okay. Um, uh, earlier in the conversation, we were uh, John was talking about Joachim and Anne, that painting, the Giotto, and uh, there was a kiss. And he says, if you you can notice that there's an uh, there's the visible and the invisible third face. Um, if you look at the painting in a certain way. And later, I think we mentioned um, the coin of Octavian, and you see the, the two faces of the file of the father and the son. And he mentions in the text that money is the third person in this holy trinity on um, this, uh, the coin of Octavian. Um, I'm very curious about this third phase. Um, and later on in the text on page 202, I just will quote this briefly. He's talking about individualism, the nascent individual. Um, at this point, uh, there's a living observer, a witness of their own lives, one could say, that, and they adopt the perspective of an outside view on themselves and thus augment their interfacial spheric opening with a second pair of eyes that strangely enough is not even their own. I think that's really fascinating. I think that when it's not their own, that second pair of eyes, the visible, invisible, that third face, I think that happens to us a lot. I, I just, a uh, personal anecdote, and this was very destabilizing for me. I went, I got into an elevator and I was dressed in a tuxedo for a party and I was looking, you know, really good. And I got into the elevator with the actress Ellen Burstyn. 
whom I greatly admired. And she looked at me and she, I could tell there was a look in her eye of great interest in me and it shocked me because I was always gazing at her on the big screen. I was very familiar with her face and the, all the roles that she had played, but it was stunning experience for me to see that she was gazing at me. And we were alone in an elevator. <laughs> Later, 10 years later, I saw her again on the street and she approached me um, because she was parking her car and she was looking for coins and she didn't know how to put them in the meter or how many coins she needed to put in the meter. And she asked me, do you know, do you know how much money I need to put in the meter? And I recall that I had seen her like 10 years previously in this elevator. And I don't know if she was aware of a previous that previous connection or not, but I'm, I am aware of how faces that change over time um we get to know actors and actresses as they age on the big screen we see the the almost uh, we remember their voices and their faces from previous performances maybe decades before when they were young and now they're elderly i think those kinds of transformations are, are very fascinating because i think it plays on that visible and invisible that third face um that looking at ourselves from the outside of ourselves. Um, I think that kind of thing can lead to destabilization and dissociation, which I think is pretty epidemic in our culture right now. Um, so anyway, I'm just throwing that out there because I think um, the, the interplay of the senses, the visual, the kinesthetic, the auditory, once these are stabilized, um, they can be destabilized by certain kinds of cultural forces that I think we're all pretty familiar with. And I'm just wondering about what happens next, because we're looking, we're, even as we are having this conversation using uh, this, uh, using Zoom, we see a certain version of each other's spaces in different rooms and different places around the globe. And I'm just wondering what this is doing to our nervous system. And I think- You know, I, I, this is self-serving. Uh, and it's, it has nothing to do with the text, but I, did, I wrote an entire book about this. It's interesting that John mentions this because this is uh, my book, Dead Celebrities, Living Icons, is precisely about that and makes just exactly the point that uh, John just made about uh, the celebrity's relationship with the various media apparatus has a destabilizing and decentering effect. Very often, not always, but more often, I think, than not. Uh, has a destabilizing effect on the celebrity's personality and can send them spiraling into psychological forms of chaos. Uh, and I think this is a phenomenon that, uh, you know, the self-destructive celebrity whose faciality uh, forms a kind of feedback loop through electronic repetition of the image. And of course, Andy Warhol was the first artist, I think, to capture this feedback resonance effect of faciality through electronic media poured back into the celebrity psyche in his art. I think he was the first with his sort of obsessive compulsive repetitive images of Liz Taylor and so forth to, to really capture that. But it had already been happening before he caught it in the New York art world uh, in the 50s with phenomena such as Elvis Presley and James Dean and Marilyn Monroe, uh, famous uh, individuals whose psyches were destabilized, uh, my thesis anyway, and dead celebrities living icons, were destabilized by their interaction with uh, initially the big screen with Elvis, it was television, as well as other the film. And with Marilyn Monroe, it was purely a filmic uh, and photographic process of destabilization with the double selves, Norma Jean Baker and Marilyn Monroe and so forth. And these destabilizations that take place in the psyche uh, have gradually been, been democratized uh, to the rest of us through the proliferation of uh, media such as YouTube and uh, Facebook, of course, uh, and our iPhones. And each individual now has their own sort of personal celebrity cult of me now. And so it's been democratized through these kinds of media. And so now we can all experience the kind of destabilizing effects that these media can uh, inflict. <laughs> I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. I, I, just, um, I mentioned it and, and I, I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's great, Don. I have to read your book. I think the uh, destabilizing effect on this, the movie star is also being produced by the projections from strangers, people they've never met and never will meet but that gets stuck, I hate to sound new agey, in their aura, you know? So they are uh, probably need to find a way of clearing themselves so that they can function as an ordinary person. 
And I think there are many actors and actresses who successfully do that. But it's the ones who are extremely vulnerable to other people's projections who um, crash and burn. Right. Yeah. But, but um, aren't we all forced to be actors and actresses now? And I think we're all crashing and burning to some extent. <laughs> I mean, is, isn't that kind of the precipitating uh, fact of our, you know, of our lives? I mean, even of this meeting, in a certain way for me, doing this reading group is, is a flight from a, 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 a state of destabilization, which I was particularly experiencing acutely uh, through my interactions on Facebook. Uh, you know the semantic inter you know interfacial uh, interfacial space of our age, uh, and it's so interesting and ironic that here we are. I'm looking at a grid of, of faces. You're seeing my face. We're recording this, so a, a public will see our face. We're performing a conversation. There's a performative aspect to our you know our our speaking about this this subject. It's staged, uh, and you know, we're enacting it. Uh, so we're kind of caught up in the, in the very themes that, that Slodrek is discussing in this chapter, but which we don't, I think, typically reflect. I certainly uh, haven't like, thematically reflected upon uh, in the way that the impressions that I'm receiving uh, from not just the book, but our experience here right now uh, are, are awakening in me or causing in me. Uh, I was reminded of um, Rupert Sheldrake's uh, experiments on the sense of being stared at, you know, in the sense that people can, yeah. like, someone, someone can look at you uh, from behind you and you can tell they're every so. I think, I think the idea that you know, our senses are not merely passive, but projective, and that, um, and that our sense of being perceived is actually a big part of, of who we are. Um, I'm also reminded of um, Rene Girard uh, and his, uh, his theory about the sacrificial victim and, um, and um, m- uh, mimetic desire. Because uh, his, his idea is that, you know, the, the sacrificial, the societies uh, that didn't, pr- like, uh, before societies with legal structures, they, uh, in order to maintain peace, they had to, have a single uh, person upon whom they uh, would project all their uh, all, all, all their unsatisfied desires and and, um, and anger, and this person uh, would be set apart from society not 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 merely in a negative way. Often, often this sort of sacrificial victim would be given this, this praiseworthy role and and seen uh, as uh, and sort of hoisted on people's shoulders right right up until the point that when they're all when they're killed um and and he talks about even monarchies actually can can uh, act as sort of uh what the monarch can act as a sacrificial victim set, set apart from society encouraged to engage in taboos that are forbidden to others like such as incest um so that they can be sort of they can absorb these sort of aspects of ourselves that we don't want. And I, I feel like even celebrity culture kind of per, uh, perpetuates that where people on the one hand, they, they become our, our gods, but, the, but they're the sacrifice gods. That, that, uh, yeah. yeah, has anyone seen the movie, uh, The Stoning of Soraya M? <clears throat> That's uh, um, that ex- is like a concrete visual representation of exactly Girard's theory of what he was talking about, where uh, apparently a, in a village in Iran, uh, in 1979, this woman was stoned to death. They were still stoning people to death. Mm-hmm. Uh, for, and this woman had supposedly had an adulterous affair, but not really. But the villagers perceived her as having this affair. And so they all got together, including her family and her children. This is a true story. Her family and her children, and they stoned her to death. And it's really shocking and horrific. And, but it brings home, in a visceral sense, the Girard's theory of the, of the sacrifice of the, the one who is set apart as the scapegoat and all the the anger and angst and projections uh, that are animating the village or upsetting them get projected like a black hole into this one figure who then takes those down with her into the abyss and cleanses the psyche of the village so that it can function normally again. It's a horrific idea, but uh, you know, to what degree it works, I don't know. I, I mean, it's, it's horrible to think about, but uh, it's, it's a I don't think it does work. <laughs> old practice. Well, do, what proof do we have that it does or it doesn't, is, is what I wonder. Well, look at our world today. 
it survived so long. One, one has to wonder if there was we, some cleansing aspect to it. Right. But then the allowed, you know, but and the now scene. we have our celebrities to do this too, like like uh, Jonathan was saying. Now we have our celebrities to stone death. So go, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's true. Let me just throw in here in the um, because the word scapegoat came up in that ancient Hebrew goat, goat herding culture. They projected it all onto a goat that they sent out. They didn't have to stone the person. They didn't have to kill a human being. They did this in another way. And so there are alternative means of taking care of that. They're also horrific, I suppose, and it's because we have to deal with things that are very deep and unsettling within us, but there are ways and means of doing that. Right. And uh, for Gerard himself, who, who is a Catholic, uh, you know, he, he, he sees Christ as a sort of turning point in that where he proves not uh, where he uh, like overturns the regime of the sacrificial victim uh, by being the by being the innocent sacrificial victim. who proves not only his own innocence, but the innocence of the sacrificial of the sacrificial victim writ large. And therefore, he sees the, the role of Christianity as sort of undoing the sacrificial consciousness within humanity it sort of did it as a transcendental signified Mm -hmm. for the culture as a whole by uplifting the image of a single sacrifice Mm -hmm. a a monumental event in hegel's term the axial events uh, of history around which everything pivots as a single sacrificial victim that's then Mm -hmm. uh, put onto the cross and uplifted and it becomes the primary transcendental signified for the west it almost acts as a magnet that, that performs that uh, function that was being performed by the villagers in the stoning of Sarai M for the culture as a civilization, as a, as a macro scale civilizational entity for them to then project all their uh, angst and so forth onto this one being uh, who was sacrificed and willingly sacrificed as the theology goes uh, and to become this sort of magnet for all these collective projections that then gather around this sacrificed being. And so one wonders then, to, the, to what degree does the collapse of this transcendental signified, the disintegration of the transcendental signified or the iconic status of the crucifix then loses that function, that organizing function for the entire society, and then we start getting the proliferation of all these weird sacrificial phenomena, such as what we've been talking about with celebrities and, mm-hmm. and um, you know, mass violence and the increase of rage and shootings uh, and, and mm-hmm. so forth. One wonders about that. To, to what degree that image held the society together as a kind of hinge that pulled everything and integrated it successfully, and the dismantling of it being uh, not a good thing for the society. I, I wonder about that. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we're all. I'm sorry, Wendy. Were you going to speak? Oh, I was going to hear another voice. Uh, I was just responding because I think, uh, looking at our media and how we're using it in Facebook and how we're somatizing disturbances in this in our society where we're confronted by so many faces on in our social media and um and i think some of us are uh, like i just used that example of uh responding and, and somewhere in my my mind was aware of this uh my friend and his dog and him putting down this dog now i didn't have a I didn't have a, th- a, a scenario or a story or a narrative, but I just got this strong emotional uh, flash. And I have a funny feeling, this is happening to us all the time. To various degrees, we're aware of it. Um, but I think now that we're uh, sort of being invaded by so many faces every day uh, and through our social media, with so many stories, and none of it is integrated. Um, most of the stories we get are you know, temporary attempts to make something coherent. But we see so many of them that at the end of the day, if we're using social media a lot, I think there's a lot of um, uh, this, uh, a lot of more de- destabilization than there is camaraderie or intimacy. So I, I hope this, what we're doing today is sort of a, an antidote to that kind of frantic, absorbing stuff that probably doesn't even belong to us, but we still take it home with us. So I'm just sharing that with you because I think... Um, this is sort of like what, what Sheldrake was talking about, that morphogenetic field. Um, we may be tuning into very uh, intrusive energies. And if we don't know how to clear ourselves, uh, we may be creating a great deal of havoc. And I think that's why we're all, to some extent, getting scapegoated. 
so I don't know that that strategy is going to work anymore because we can't pick a person, dump all of our projections onto them and s string them up. <laughs> it just isn't going to stabilize or unify us anymore. Um, anyway. If, if I could jump in, I'd like to, oh, sorry. To, uh, okay, I guess I'm gonna run with it. Um, I just wanna jump in and kind of extend this by saying that I think, um, you know, part of, to, I think Michael originally was the one who kind of raised the perspective that we, we could be looking for something prescriptive or at least, you know, some guidance toward how to how to be or how to how to respond to this reality that I think everyone has been talking about really really eloquently, um, which is that sort of dest the destabilization, the scapegoating, and the the democratization, as as John Ebert put it, of of this sort of celebrity uh, breaking uh, breaking a part of self or or uh, de you know destabilizing of of identity. Um, I, I guess I have a sense that there's so directly in response to that i have i have other thoughts but i'll i'll table those for the moment but directly in response to this question of how to be i i found that uh Sloterdijk's description of the buddha is is really important here which is to say that um you know we're, we're talking here about and and rightly so but we're talking about all the things that are wrong with our society now and you know how we've how one argument is that, you know, this, the lack of scapegoating or the lack of having someone we can project everything onto and then string up there is, is sort of a destabilizing factor or that the argument being, and, and this comes up in other places, you know, that the, the purge is the thing that keeps society integrated, the ability to purge or to otherwise, you know, push into a, into a safe vessel or, a, or at least a constrained vessel, all of our bad things. And, you know, um, and I, I was really, is interesting to hear the insight about, uh, Christianity shifting that dynamic, although I think, you know, my initial thought was, oh, that's exactly what the Christ figure is, is someone who is the ultimate vessel for all of our bad stuff, who just kind of takes it and cleanses us by taking it all on. Um, but I think that the, anyway, to get back to the Buddha, I think that the important, the important thing there is, is in that passage um, where we talk about the, the Buddha being constantly present and ready for whatever comes without any judgment without any agenda, but just sort of present and aware. And it's sort of, to me, that's an, that's a important figure because it's maybe not an antidote, but it's a different way. So if you think of the Buddha as being someone who could be and would be targeted and, and projected upon and given all of the pain and all of the bad stuff. Um, what's amazing about the Buddha figure is that they're not a passive vessel. Uh, they're actually in a sense, I get, what I'm trying to get at and I'm having a hard time getting there is that, that that presence and that ability to be to be genuinely responsive, um, without judgment, without your own projection, kind of coming into play, to me that's that's a, another way to break the cycle. In other words, if, if that's the state of the Buddha, and you come up to the Buddha projecting your bullshit onto the Buddha, as it were, just to use this as kind of a thought experiment, you're not going to get the sort of um, sacrificial victim. You're not going to. That's not what you're not going to be able to overcome in a sense, the will or the being of the Buddha by projecting your bullshit onto them and making them what you want them to be. Right. And that's, I, I, anyway, I'm not really having, I'm not really finding a good way to put it, but I think that's really important because that figure to me represents the sort of strength to break that cycle without, without it being a force of will. Right. Because that's the whole point is the Buddha is just sitting there smiling at you and you feel like a dumbass because you're projecting your shit onto the Buddha. Not because the Buddha makes you feel like a dumbass. Do you see what I'm saying? So it is—it is a sort of a type of mirror that I think can break that cycle. Anyway, I don't know—I don't know if I fully have that thought through, but I—I I think that's I'd, really important. I'd like to echo Nate, yeah, uh, and bring it back to Girard in the same moment. Um, my understanding of Girard is that um, human socialization necessarily involves both a kind of enabling. I imitate the actions of the other in relation to some object of desire in the world and simultaneously sets up an unconscious rivalry. That object might be scarce, or is experienced by the infant as scarce, and hence is a threat the other, other's desire, which allows me access to the apple, is also the very desire that will take the apple away. And this socialization process sets up an, a kind of knot, an individuation, he calls it, in which um, culture is unstable because it both has these collective common conventions of practice and it has these, these desires, these socialized desires, 
which are always in conflict and have an unconscious aggression to them. And so what historically emerged were a whole series of um, explicit and then in modernity with things like law, um, sort of sublimated versions of sacrifice in some sense. And scapegoating, sca sacrifice, scandal discourse, which is all, are all over the place in our culture, um, seem to be very much alive. In my understanding of Girard's understanding of the, the crucifixion is that it's been partly misread in Christianity, the tradition misread it, that actually Christ was trying to show the absurdity of the, of the sacrificial mechanism. He was trying to sort of parody it in some way. And I'm not sure that's a convincing argument. And that the only solution that I, I've come across in Girard is actually a, a higher form of mimesis. And that form is to take up love of the neighbor, that it's imitating Christ. It's an imitation of Christ. It's emptying oneself to such a degree that love becomes the mimetic model in relationship to others that can slowly dissolve this aggression of the human being in relation to others. And I would kind of echo the sense of the Buddha, where um, this radiating of joy as a transmission um, has no agenda, right? It has no agenda, and it, can, it could diffuse these kinds of projections and so on. So, but I also find John Ebert's, uh, John, your discussion of the transcendental signified of the, and that falling apart and the decentering and fragmenting and everyone's now a victim and everyone is sacrificed and Montana representatives are sl body slamming guardian people is everywhere it is a kind of like something is unhinged and it, with these sacrificial um, victim mentality mechanisms. Well, it's not unifying them anymore. That's what's the problem. They, they're looking for scapegoats, and uh, the only thing that unifies them is a scapegoat. And if they don't have one, they're oh, in that's big right. trouble. That's they, right. start well, apart. they start beating their kids and beating up their wife and getting drunk and creating mayhem. So they need to find an enemy. And I think that's a really big problem. And, and uh, the question is, what's the way out? I agree with you. And what's the way out of that? I mean, for Gerard, right or wrong, this is a very deep process in human being in this more or less quote unquote fallen world. So how do you move out of that? I think that's well, you know, uh, we talk about Buddha and Christ and these uh, beautiful images from Western art. Uh, I just wanted to bring a recently a uh, film that won best, uh, best movie this last year was uh, Moonlight. And I've been, I saw the film many times. I think I saw it about four times and I took friends to see it. It was a real communal kind of cathartic experience for me. And I listened to the director of the film, Barry Jenkins, making a decision like on the set. Uh, you, you saw these two characters uh, having a dialogue with one another. And he asked one of the, I think it was an actress, to turn and look directly into the camera. So the audience looked right into her eyes. And he did this with all the, the major characters. He had them look into the camera. So the audience looked right into their eyes. And he did this in, a, in an intuitive, but a very intentional way because something happens to people in the audience as they all of a sudden are inside that person. They lose their sense of, I'm over here, the image is over there. All of a sudden, uh, they're, they're starting to embody or enter into that uh, character's world in a very uh, visceral way. So I thought that film is an excellent example of what can happen when um, you, you know, have a, a very good ensemble, a very good script, and you have a very smart director. And I, I, you know, straight people, I saw like, you know, really hardcore straight guys say they saw that movie, it's, it's, a, gay, it's a gay love story. And they said, you know, it made them cry. So I think that is where the hope is, uh, it's when we can all of a sudden can't separate ourselves easily from the dilemmas and the paradoxes another person has. So um, I think um, in this particular character, the character of Chiron in this particular movie, he was scapegoated, um, but, the, but he, says he survives that. And I think he reclaims his dignity. And I think the audience benefits enormously and I think that's how our culture can start shifting. We don't see many movies like that, but it's my hope that we would have more 
uh, artists like that working at that level. I, th I think, I mean, um, if you look at uh, like shifting attitudes towards things like homosexuality, uh, towards people of other races, it's it, it's often through friendships and acquaintance that that people overcome their prejudices. You know, I, the, a person of my generation is much more likely than the parents' generation to know a person who is gay or trans or is an immigrant or uh, or something like that, and um, and that, and that's and, and that tends to breed more progressive attitudes for like. Um, uh, uh, which at the same time we're in a big sacrificial crisis right now with Donald Trump and uh, you know, the the rise of these far right parties across Europe, uh, you know, as as this anti immigrant, uh, you know, anti uh, multiculturalism uh, ethos uh, they become rampant, and people are are seeking a scapegoat for uh, you know the, for this this economic mess that we've found ourselves in as a, as a result of globalization. So, uh, so yeah, so I was saying, finding that find that solution is like more urgent than ever. I think. So, so what's Solidar X prescription here? Uh, one thing that I keep coming back to is the mother principle, is that primary dyad, uh, and the um, the the wholesomeness of it, the healthiness of it in its at least in its some ideal form. Uh, I think obviously in reality, it's, it's, it's not, uh, always wholesome. Uh, it's off, it's broken. Uh, and insofar as that primary relationship with the mother is part of a you know, wider, wider network of relationships with themselves are frayed and broken. That experience is, uh, uh, doesn't get to transpire. doesn't get to, doesn't get to happen in a healthy way. A lot of the times, uh, and it seems that one of the things that he's saying, uh, or at least implying in this book, or at least one of the discourses that the book connects to, is that that kind of notion of a primary trauma, uh, which occurs because we become alienated from our own our own relationality, uh, our own primary relationality, like that field that is prior to the semiological you know, distinctions that we make uh, that is really just the magical uh, do d domain or dimension in Gibbs's terminology. Um, it's uh, a childlikeness because as the, as the baby is like if we, in, insofar as we, we carry within us the, the residue or the trace or the, or the, or the real felt reality of that primary experience uh and, and and we become traumatized at that level, then that's going to act. We're going to act that out on every other level in every other sphere. Uh, and so, how do you restore that? You know, how do you reintegrate that? Uh, there's an element, I think, of regression if you were to look at it from the perspective of like developmental psychology that that Solerich seems to be indicating uh, with this text. And we've gone now from the heart space. To the face space, the heart space originally is the child inside of the mother's body, right? Feel the heartbeat so close that it's it's within you. The, the other's heart is within you, uh, and now to the to the differentiation that happens with the face when there's two faces, but those two faces and the multi faces of you know uh, of a society are at first not differentiated. It's the the radiance of the mother gazing at the innocence, uh, the vulnerability, the openness uh, of the child. Uh, I, I know as a, as a father how um, the, the samadhi that I felt uh, when I first held my, my daughter when she was a newborn. Uh, the, there was that, um, what Sloterdijk calls in his text, a, uh, the, 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 the melting point, the, the, the greenhouse effect or the, the intersubjective greenhouse effect. I don't I don't recall his exact words. He expressed it in a few different ways, but that sort of melting point that happens when, uh, when our semantic or semiological distinctions break down and we just feel a communion with the other. Uh, and in that first instance, it's, it's the mother. I think, I mean, there's, that's not coming from an abstract plane. That's not, that's not a platonic form. That's a bio, bio spiritual experience, right? It, 
it's it's something that's really specific to our form as as humans uh and it'd be interesting to you know, we talked a bit about last week about post-humanism and um, maybe that connects here as well but there's something i think profoundly human in the sen- in the in the idea that that primary experience of being a a mammal a baby mammal uh more than a mammal but uh, a, a person like an incipient person in a pre-semantic relationship with a loving other who just beams at you and makes you feel good and makes you feel nourished uh makes you feel whole uh coming out of that state of you know being born being thrown uh and uh being incompleted uh through the through the act of birth of being of being birthed uh one I mean, one of the things I think that art does really well, if it's good art, is that it integrates that magical, emotional, and bio-spiritual uh, level. Uh, it, it integrates that experience uh, across the, the across the different structures of consciousness in Gabe's you know, terms. So, uh, and 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 it brings it into development. It brings it into a cultural sphere that could be shared uh, more broadly. And that, that, I think, is the power of a movie like, like Moonlight, as you describe it, uh, John. And I've, I've, uh, I have s- similar experiences, really profound. I mean, they're, to me, the most, some of the most profound experiences of my life when I really commune with a work of art. And another person, in a sense, shows me my own original face, if you will, through the enactment of their creative vision. Uh, that my, the distinction breaks between me and other uh breaks down it doesn't but it doesn't break down into a regression it breaks down into like a, a greater openness a greater enlightenment uh and so i i also appreciate how sloterdijk brings the buddha figure and that sort that model of uh equanimous presence uh as kind of a, a way of perhaps reintegrating the receptive maternal and feminine principle with a an equanimity that comes through uh the the a, a disciplined practice as you know, the, the 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 buddha the buddhist path uh would uh would invite one to uh and so I, again i don't know exactly where that lands but other than that uh that in some sense I think what I get, what I'm getting from Sloterdijk is that philosophy should be fun and there should be an enjoyable aspect to it. Like we should enjoy, uh, the, the thought that we're embodying in this, this kinds of conversations. Uh, and that even though it's a sort of marginal activity and, uh, I, I was reading, um, a, a, an excerpt from, uh, Sloterdijk's, uh, Remind me of the title, but it's Thoughts on the Human Zoo, something like that, John? Rules for the Human Park, yeah. Rules for the Human, the human Park, or the, I mean, another translation is the Human Zoo. Yeah, or Zoo, there's, there's two different translations. Rules for the Human Zoo, one, the other one. Um, yeah, so that, there's, an interesting, uh, there's some interesting things to think about there, because who wants to think of themselves as a, as a zoo animal? But what he's is saying there is that, there's a civilizing or taming function that uh, is important, you know, as, as part of uh, our ability to live together on a, you know, on a planet in, 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 a, in a social sphere. And, I've, and you know, that, that has not been accomplished, <laughs> obviously, uh, to date. Uh, and, you know, Heidegger argues that humanism has not accomplished that. And so you know, being, it has to be accomplishment of being. Sloterdijk is also in, in a conversation with, you know, with, with Heidegger and with humanism, I think, um, in, in these pages. Um, but I guess I'm getting into the mushy, doughy space well, uh, I, again. And the, I, I would like to, I'd like to speak to one piece. Okay? And um, I really appreciate what you're saying, Marco, about the, uh, the mother bond. And, uh, and development. And the, the most um, synthetic work that's from a philosopher, but is drawing upon various psychological models that might address this is Michael Washburn in his book, Embodied Spirituality in a Sacred World. 
and he really does equate this um the the differentiating of a, a separate self as a movement away from both the mother and the dynamic ground he calls it and he yet honors development he is an anti-development which some of these models have and yet there's a need for certain dimensions to go back into all of that to reunify to the dynamic ground and he calls this regression in the service of transcendence and he's got a very careful map of this so there's both sort of wilberian like development and something else going on about down and these are simultaneous and needed for a kind of fullness of awakening a fullness of relationship and awakening um, and it is centered in the mother and it is centered in recovering that so I, I thought that was I, I i agree with what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can i add something to that also um you're talking about the the heart and the face and I think the face and the heart are very connected. And I believe that we can look at other people in such a way as to register something quite invisible. Um, I know, uh, and talking about the human and the non-human and the, or the, the, the post-human, that thing has been coming up. A friend of mine who lived in the neighborhood, she told me a story. She was raised by uh, Polish immigrants and... Um, her father and her mother were from the old country and she was learning English. And I think she was having trouble with her arithmetic. And I think she was, made, she said she was like eight or nine years old. And her father was like tutoring her. And she had a bird that she kept in a cage, but the, the door of the, 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 the cage bird, the, the door was open so the bird could come and go as it wanted to. Anyway, the father was tutoring the daughter and she was having trouble. The father got really, frustrated and angry and he ended up hitting her in his frustration and anger and the bird flew out of the cage and started to peck him and the father was so shocked by this bird's intervention <laughs> that he sat down and he he got very quiet and he never hit her again and i just i think that's a very remarkable story that sometimes this is uh, the, the, the most highly ethical and altruistic aspects of our nature are sometimes carried by some animal. You know, you hear these human, these rescue stories, you hear about these lost animal stories, how they, uh, an animal who was lost on the other side of the thousands of miles away can somehow find its family. I think there's, you know, something going on there that's very mysterious. And um, I'm hoping, and I, and I do believe this, connects to what we've been talking about and the text that we're studying because i do think he's there are a lot of overlaps and i think he is talking i think he is moving from a kind of humanist to a, perhaps a post-humanist um kind of development anyway i just wanted to put that out there because we've been talking about this online i'll just mention that on the at the coffee shop down the street from me uh you know how the co coffee shops will rotate different artwork on the walls. Well, currently there's the work of a local photographer who takes uh, portraits of rescue animals. Uh, so these are all uh, dogs and, and cats who are you know, looking for foster guardians or parents or whatever. Uh, and, and it's all pictures of their face. But, uh, so th there is that protection, protraction doesn't, I think, make interfaciality uh, exclusive to the to the human uh i have a, a, a dog i used to have two and i love her face <laughs> and she looks at me and when she wants my attention she stares at me and and exercises some form of uh all, all mental control uh because i get up and i feed her or i let her out and i i do what she <laughs> what she wills and i feel her really i feel her staring into me i feel her boring into my mind it, it's really uncanny actually and I've studied it. I've studied the phenomenology of what I'm experiencing when she does this. Uh, and it's a, it's a profound psychic uh, connectivity uh, that's, that's there. Uh, and she has a face. Uh, so uh, the, it, it's, not, it's not just human. Uh, and at the same time, uh, of course, the, the, you know, as fellow humans, it's, it's particularly animated for us because our faces can do a lot more things than the, than the dog can. Than the dogs can do so the range of our emotion out, emotional connection 
our emotional connectivity, uh, as I think you're saying, the connection between face and, and heart uh, really comes to all those comes down to all those hundreds of muscles, uh, you know, coordinating to uh, create these uh, these loops uh, between us uh, when we when we see each other. And of course, that's what's so difficult about the interface. And what happened to me earlier, as soon as I started talking about interfaces, my interface broke down, completely just totally froze up. Uh, maybe that was a message from being, um, but, uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting, uh, to, to reflect on what, you know, what's actually been going on in, in our real experience of, of each other and, of, you know, the mirror of relationship. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's quite fascinating. Hey, if I may, uh, um, Marco, I wanted to respond to uh, something you raised a little bit earlier when you were talking about, um, so how do we resolve this, uh, this kind of chaos that's going on in our society? What, what, what would be the new kinds of faciality that would come up that would, of course, f- faciality, I think, is always reflective already of, of processes that are already going on in the society. But I think that, um, and you raised Slaughterdyke's essay, uh, Rules for the Human Zoo. It's worth commenting that in that essay, he makes a distinction between uh, media that are traditionally inhibiting and media that have are that have a detrimental or disinhibiting function on the culture. And he says that, for instance, the book, which is a missive uh, written by one and it's the basis of humanism, which is sent out. It's a sort of letter uh, written by someone that is sent out to an unknown reader, whoever that's going to be, but it has an inhibitory effect. It has a civilizing function, a domesticating function. Uh, with the Romans and the gladiatorial arenas, we have a classic example of what he calls disinhibiting media, where those media in that time were breaking down, they weren't working, the society was becoming illiterate, disliterate, non-literate, and so forth. And uh, the, glad- the rise of the gladiatorial arenas put the theater out of business, because why go see people faking death on stage when you can go see it for real? People chose the real thing, and it had a negative violent feedback effect on the society as a whole. And I think that part of the problem with the situation that we're in right now is that it is the job of the arts, uh, the arts, art, myth, religion, and culture to resolve these uh, problems for us, to provide new iconotypes, new signifieds uh, that will replace the disintegration of the master signifiers that have ruled the West for 2,000 or so years, maybe more if you want to go back to Pluto and Greeks and so forth. Those are uh, iconotypes are being disintegrated. The problem is when we turn to highbrow art, what we're left with is a very poor example in contemporary art because with contemporary art right now, um, the basis of the art is aniconic. It's deconstructive. It's, it's based on a mistrust ever since Malevich's black square and his white. It's based on a, a deconstruction of the image and a mistrusting of all traditional iconotypes as essentially binding, colonializing, uh, produced by white men to subjectify the, the rest of us. Uh, and there's no trust in these meta narratives anymore. They're, and so contemporary art thinks its task is simply to take the images and keep pulling them apart. And so that's what it's doing. So it's not providing us with any kind of inhibitory, integrating, sphere-forming functions. Everything is broken down into these foamic little tiny microspheres. And contemporary art, I think, has invalidated itself for the task. Okay, so what are we left with? We're left with popular culture. Popular culture provides us with, through film and uh, bestsellers and graphic novels provides us with all these images. Um, but the problem there is that that would serve normally what the function of traditional art was to serve, which was a binding inhibitory function. But popular art provides us with all of these disinhibiting images. What we see are images of sex and violence, people solving their problems through resorting to violence. Um, almost invariably, that's what any narrative is going to tell us with these popular narratives of superheroes and so forth that the way to resolve your problems is by resorting to violence. And humans being mimetic animals uh, tend to imitate the images that they see proliferating around them. So whatever's proliferating around them is what they're going to imitate. And because popular culture is providing us with all these images, this is what people imitate. And so it feeds back in a negative way into the society and continues further pulling it apart. Yes, we have these iconic images in our head of Bruce Lee, and, uh, you, know, you know, whatever the, uh, your favorite movie star is, but they are pulling the culture apart, both from a popular level and at the level of the highbrow arts. 
And so the arts are in a situation where that's where the response is supposed to normally come from to integrate the culture by providing new forms of master signifiers, new forms of faciality and so forth. But now we're getting from technology, we're getting these new bizarre forms of faciality like this one, for instance, or Facebook uh, where people are reduced to the level of two dimensional electronic trading cards on Facebook. And so it's not a very satisfying uh, response to the problem that we're faced with. And so we're really in a kind of a mess here uh, with this civilization. It's, it's, it's a massive uh, world acumeny uh, that is based on violence uh, as a problem solving method that is full of images and terrorists have taken over the media apparatus and they have Boris Groys writes about this in one of his essays that the terrorist has, appar- uh, has taken over the apparatus of the media Uh, with YouTube and the video camera and so forth. And they are the ones who have provided a lot of these unsettling iconic images that are imprinted on the mass psyche. No one's ever going to forget the images of the falling of the trade towers during 911, for instance, that normally would have been provided by art, but art is failing to do this. Nobody much cares about it insofar as it has a sphere forming function uh, that imprints and creates icons on the society. So we're really in an unsettled mode here where all the traditional roles are shifting around and everything is being transformed into what Zygmunt Bauman calls liquid modernity. All the, all the archetypes are in a process of magmatic liquefaction. Um, so we're in a transitional phase here and we're all struggling. And I think what we're doing here today is, is a response. It's a form of struggling with the crisis that, that we're in right now. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah. I'd like to jump in, in uh, briefly in response to what you just said, John, and then, to articulate what, I, what I've come to see as a common theme, a common thread in some of the recent, uh, some of the stuff we've been talking about, which is also a bit of a taking in a different direction. Um, it, just in direct, in direct response to what John said, I think that the, um, you know, one thing that, that I'm, that was implied in, in that, or, or that I'd like to clarify coming out of that is that while I completely agree that our, our current technologies are, a source of this distortion or a source of this uh, further alienation. I, I, I resist any kind of technological determinism that says it is technology itself that is having this effect. I, I think Zoom and Facebook and any other technology that we want to look at is creating a sort of a weird effect. I think I completely agree, but I think that has to do with choices made in the development of that technology in the same kind of, uh, of a... F- well, that's naive. That's naive. No, tech, technology is not something that is value neutral. To every technology imposes upon us, and I know I'm being rude here. I'm sorry for that. You are being rude, John. I, I'm sorry, but technology is an entelechy that is very has a very deterministic function. I mean, this is the whole media studies tradition. Let me let me be clear that I'm oh, fully right. aware of that. But but you're right. Let, let him excuse. Yeah. Well, just to be clear, like I'm. I'm not making the claim that technology is value neutral in any sense. That's something that I'm. I'm pretty deeply. Uh, I feel the same way. I pretty deeply believe in that. Uh, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that I think that the, the values that are encoded and the assumptions that are encoded in the technologies that we use, which are in no way value neutral, um, are one among any number of different values that we can encode in a set of technologies. And now that's not to say that it's simple and that there's not path determinism. And I guess I'm starting to sense that maybe this is, this isn't really what I wanted to even talk about. And it's kind of its own conversation, but um, what I what I want to say is simply that the the, the perspective that I want to take that I'm trying to take relative to this is just that um, my sense is that there is to, in many ways technology, for lack of a better term, has, as you as you said, serves sort of has taken some of the function that traditionally the arts might take. In other words, it's there. You know, there's uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm feeling a bit I don't know, like a bit like I have to unpack a lot of things that I don't quite feel prepared to unpack again, because this wasn't even the thing I wanted to uh, say, say in this, in this conversational turn, but that I think there's a, a tendency that we have to, or, or rather we're in a situation where technology in many ways for better and for worse has taken that integrative function in our society. And it, it in the sense that art does not have that same sort of macro spherological or integrative sort of function at a higher level that our technologies, our Facebooks and our, our sort of social media and infrastructures for sociality through technology has, has taken over that functionality. And, and I'm not necessarily making the claim that, that, that I, I'm simply making the claim that things, that certain aspects of that technological infrastructure uh, 
have the potential to be points of intervention and the same, and it comes back to something that, that what you're talking about made me think of, which is uh, something in the, in the post-humanist in particular, um, Bruno Latour wrote a great article called why has critique run out of steam where he's essentially making the same argument that I think you're making John, which is that um, our academic, our mode of deconstructionism has become so dominant that we haven't, we've lost the ability to propose a reintegrative and reconstructionist kind of, you know, we've lost the ability to, to do reconstructionism. And as a result, what, what Latour is pointing out is that all of this deconstructionism and, and the deconstruction of sort of scientific practice that, that Latour and others are, are sort of responsible for and claiming responsibility for, at least within the academic realm, is what is, what is leading to the global warming denialism and all these other kind of distorted versions of, of this sort of deconstructionist urge that has become dominant in society. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't, again, I don't really know where I was going with that. I just wanted to say that I think that we, we have that, we have in our, in our current situation technologies that further, further this sort of, um, d- well, anyway, I had a whole, I have a whole idea of a common thread, but I, I feel like that's maybe for, for later. Um, and the common thread has to do with just, the turning away that the idea that when when faced with the opportunity to connect with someone when when the turning away when someone is i think that this is the source of a lot of the uh a lot of the alienation that leads to the rage and the shootings and so on is when someone and it it's maybe starts with the mother and child relationship but when you seek that that response from the other and instead you get the other turning away or ignoring i think that there's that's a common thread in a lot of pathology is that we're that we're talking about at different levels both with the mother and child with the celebrity and certainly with just day-to-day you know making connections and the fact that when you when you don't turn away when you have a chance to talk with someone and interact with someone directly it creates the, the possibility for a resilient social bond social capital and the ability to change and overcome sort of uh prejudices or biases that that would otherwise distort or further kind of perpetuate this process of us turning away from each other and scapegoating each other and creating a grotesque image of each other. Um, anyway, that's a lot of stuff. So I'll, I'll stop there. My apologies, Nate, for interrupting. I'm sorry about that. I got a little carried away. Sure. And I understand. The, I, the hothouse, the hothouse effect. Okay. It's the greenhouse <laughs> effect of a uh, zoom call. If we could talk I, about, Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Marco. So. Oh, that's all. Uh, I, I, do, I do want to point out that we're, kind of near the 90 minute mark uh but if we want to take some time to cool off and to you know sub- continue unpacking a few more ideas i'm i'm available if anybody needs to leave uh this would be a, perhaps a good time um i'll stick on uh i also want to make sure that i acknowledge donna who, has, who who's uh, been with us and uh give her a chance to uh to contribute to the conversation if she wishes to uh, you know, as we kind of go back and forth, and I think we're actually talking about substantial matters here. Uh, I, I I realize that uh, we can, um, you know, that we need to sort of t- take our foot off the accelerator uh, accelerator uh, a little bit and just survey what we're really even trying to resolve. Uh, and one of those things is what is to be done. It seems is is the question. Uh, so I'll I'll give Donna. Would you? Is there anything you'd want to say or? Or, or should we just, you know, continue? It looks like you're muted. Uh, hello. Yes. Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah. Um, actually, um, I just want to mention my reflections on this chapter. Um, when I started reading chapter two, I remembered a book I've read like five years ago. Um, he is a Syrian author. And he was following the image of Ashtar in different civilizations. And it was a very interesting book because uh, it's called The Riddle or The Mystery of Ashtar. So when I read this uh, chapter, I felt it's in a way, um, for me, it was connected with that book. And um, another thing I want to comment at, it's I think towards the end of the chapter, he mentions about Lacan, the mirror stage, which I love to hear your um, your reflections, how he's trying to, to in a way, um, I felt he's trying to um, connect between what Lacan um, uh, mentioned in the mirror stage and 
where we come to realize the self and um, um, uh, the reflection also, I mean, how this is connected to the chapter, if I can hear uh, people comment on this. Thank you. He does have a, if I may say, he does have a dismissive comment about Lacan, uh, where he's talking about, he sort of dismisses Lacan's idea of the formation of the ego uh, as a result of the infant's interaction with the mirror uh, as a cultural artifact because Lacan didn't take into account that the proliferation of mirrors is really something that only happens in the 19th century, according to Slaughter, if this is correct, and that therefore you know, the transcendental subject, the ego and so forth, the formation of the, the, strong, the West's formation of the strong ego really predates the proliferation of mirrors by quite a few centuries. So that's how this chapter is, sort of dismisses uh, Lacan without further ado. Yeah. He also talks about Narcissus and, um, you know, they didn't have mirrors. Um, and Narcissus didn't know when he was gazing into his own reflection that it was his own reflection. Um, so he, he, I just quote him, he says, the, the Narcissian mishap constitutes an accident in the early stages of self-reflection. I think that's uh, really interesting um, how other people give us that sense of who we are. Uh, now, of course, we do have mirrors and we do have movies and we have photographs and we have all kinds of other ways of viewing ourselves. And I think we often take a third person relationship to ourselves that's making things very complex and maybe dysfunctional. Um, but I just wanted to add that I think at the end of the chapter, after he traces this, uh, these uh, different phases of development, that he talks about being alone, um, that um, the human wants to and is meant to have the ability to be alone. And this is what I'm dealing with right now. I mean, I like being alone. I love my solitude. I don't know that I want to give it up for anybody right now. That wasn't true a decade ago. Um, or when I was much younger, I would give up my, my, my time alone for anybody else's trouble or anybody else's drama. I got really sucked into it and I was attracted and drawn to people who had lots of dramas. Um, and I think there's a, a really, it's really a liberation when you can be alone and enjoy being alone. And I think the challenge is, can I, can we be alone together? Um, can we have relationships with people who also enjoy being alone um, rather than loners? And I think that's the trouble that a lot of people are, are having is they're not really comfortable with being alone. They're becoming loners. Um, and there's a fine line there. And I'm, I'm not necessarily, I don't know that I've resolved this. Um, all I know is I love being alone. I love my solitude. I love to read, I love to write, uh, and I also like to hang out with people who enjoy going a little bit deeper. Um, but I don't need those, you know, those butt sniffing contests where people sit around having cocktails talking about how fabulous they could be or, or want to be or used to be. I mean, you know, give me a break. And I think that's, uh, that's probably one of the advantages, I think, to some of our social media is we can be a little bit selective about who we want to hang out with. Um, rather than just going out into a social space and hoping you collect some people who you know find you find attractive or interesting, um, so anyway, that's where I think my cutting edge is: is how can I be um, create healthy relationships through the social media um, that isn't driven by nefarious uh, hidden parties, and how can I um, reactivate uh, you know, being in real time physical spaces with people where you share an environment in real time. And I live in New York. I mean, I, I see millions of people every day. And I see more and more people are looking into their devices than they are to the person that they're with. Uh, I think that's very, that's going to be very challenging for the next generation. For, for my people in my generation, I think it's uh, also very destabilizing. Anyway, just putting that out there. Thank you. So, my, my, Michael, you, you at one point wanted to make a comment. I want to invite you to do so. Uh, Ed, I, I haven't heard from you too much. Uh, 
if you'd like to say anything, but then let's wrap it up, I'd say. Uh, and uh, I might make, just say a couple of words about this conversation because I'm, I'm reflecting on it right now and just have a couple of closing thoughts. Okay. Um, I, I have just, uh, actually it's a thing for you and for John uh, Ebert. Since you both read, mentioned Park, Zoo, whatever. That was the piece that got Habermas to accuse Sloterdijk of being fascistoid. What in there caused Habermas to think that? I haven't read it. I don't know. And it, it's just one of these things. It's a side issue to this whole thing. How did that come up? What is in there that so provoked Habermas to react so negatively towards Sloterdijk? That, that would interest me personally. It has nothing to do with our conversation as it is. Um, the other thing is that Johnny just mentioned he lives in New York and there's millions of people and they're all staring at the phones and everybody's kind of isolated. I, li I live in a very small rural German community, 3,000 people in seven villages who come together. And one of the villages that makes up our, our community is called Fischbach which just means the fish stream. And in the fish stream, there's no internet. It's completely isolated. You can't get a mobile signal there. If you want to talk to someone by electronically, you have to use a telephone and you have to call a landline. You can't, you can't use your mobiles there. They're completely isolated from everything. It's probably the happiest village that I know in my community <laughs> because they're not taken up by all of this. And, and there is something about our technology that we use that is so enabling. You know, I, got to, I, get, I get to meet people like you, all of the people here in this conversation. I love all you guys. It's great that I can, I can like interface and see and hear and listen. And I'm sorry for being rude myself, John, for telling you you're being rude. Um, it's all in the heat of the discussion, but but it's it's all part it's all part of who we are, and 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 as I've noted on a number of our written threads in accompanying to this, I don't think we know who we are. I think we're sometimes afraid to acknowledge who we are. We don't want to really recognize who we are because doing that entails a huge burden. And th this is the burden of being human to me, uh, if, I, if I can say it that way. And this, this burden of being human means I have, to, I have to really think long and hard about everything I say and every effect that I might have on another human being that I encounter in some way. And this is an enormous responsibility. And, and what, we, what bothers me about a lot of the, the talks that we have about theories and uh, this guy thought this and art historically, we get this, that, and whatnot coming into it, is that, that we lose sight of the fact that it's still me somehow that's in there. And I'm still the one that has to deal with it. And I'm still the one that has to come to terms with it. And I can only do that as long as I got other folks like you who are there to help me sort that out. I can't do it. As much as I love, believe me, Johnny, I know I love being alone. I love sitting in the middle of nowhere where nobody can get to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's, it's not just who we are or who am I, but where are we? I think we talked well, about it. We can also I don't know where that. I am anymore. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that, I, who I, am. I know who I am. I know who I am, but I don't know where I am. Yeah, I know exactly. I, 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 I'm I, located I, right now. I have I no idea. That. Yeah. And, that, and that is, that's important to me because, well, we are only where we are whenever we are. <laughs> and, and here we are. <laughs> that's all I have to say. <sighs> Cool. Um, Michael, last chance before we wrap this up. Did you want to say something? Yeah, it was about art. And I loved, John Ebert, your uh, 
uh, discussion of the dilemma of both mass cultural and uh, advanced art. And um, I think that's a, it's a hugely interesting discussion. And I would just throw in quickly Walter Benjamin's essay where he charts a history where um, these, these earlier modes of art, these pre-modern contexts of art, where he called ritual values, where art was not its own autonomous, semi-autonomous sphere, its own subsystem. And it had the effect of actually re reproducing uh, unjust power relationships. So there may have been master signifieds, but for Benjamin, these master signifieds were always, in some sense, oppressive in some sense. And, um, and then, of course, Adorno disagreed with Benjamin and so on. And that he actually saw this emergence of mass cultural art as actually the, the greatest possibility. And what you're saying is it's actually decayed into a kind of modeling violence as a way out. And the last piece, it's a, it's a big discussion, just throwing some fragments. Someone like Malevich, I mean, you, had, you got me to think, you know, yeah, there is a deconstructive element to this. There is, because of this modern impulse to break with the past and be modern, to, to focus on the future and to break with convention. So he's, you know, breaking from even earlier modernist enterprises. But there's another gesture there, and I think it's essentializing, that he's actually seeking for something through an abstract language that bypasses linguistic differences, bypasses religious differences, and is seeking something more universal, a universal language. I'm not saying it is. He's seeking universal language to signify something like um, a witnessing consciousness or a non-duality or something like that. And, um, but I hadn't really thought about that there's also a deconstructive dimension and a destructive dimension to it. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. I think the art question is fantastically interesting, and I hope we pursue that. So a few fragments. Yeah. Uh, just to pick up on that and, and, and wrap it up, um, I, I want to reiterate Nate's point as well. What I think that he was trying to say, because uh, I think he, Nate, you may not have felt like you were able to quite, quite get it out, but I think I saw where you were going with that. Uh, and it came out of a question that I, to me, it was very practical, uh, which, you know, roughly put would be, you know, our, our, our spheres are obliterated in some, in some sense because of, because of the disruptive effects of, of media and social media. Uh, in times past, art would have that sphere forming, stabilizing, civilizing effect. That's no longer the case now. Uh, and the popular art that we have, uh, can further entrains uh, negative patterns. Uh, I'm maybe just chopping up and summarizing um, your your point, uh, John. And so, what is it that can provide that function, perform that function, perform that role? Uh, and what is the response that may be arising uh, through us, uh, more more broadly through other initiatives, other communities? Other other people who are trying to who are grappling with the same issues, uh, and I think that I mean, one thing that you, that Nate, Nate uh, brought into it is that there's a quality of the, of conversation. There's a quality of facing each other and staying with each other, staying in a conversation that uh, you know the, this media both enables uh, and it also um, subverts because it subverts in a certain way because if you're in a small town you can't really escape each other. Uh, if I want to escape you right now, I could flip off my phone, press a button, and you're gone. <laughs> you're as, as good as ghosts uh, to me. And you will exist in this spectral fashion for me. Uh, so given the fact that the technology allows us to do that, how do we use it in a way, and how, do we, how perhaps even do we encode it in, in a way that inclines toward uh, the, the, the depth of uh, conversation and com communion and um, you know, being withness uh, that is so uh, needed that you know that I think we feel the need for because we're human uh, and because we're alive. Uh, so I, I appreciate Ed, you're bringing it to that point too because the the, the the ones who are here now are us. We're here now talking about this. Sloterdijk is a, as good as a figment. Right? The, the, his text is markings on a page until we bring it to life through our, through our dialogue. 
And, you know, every time we do a talk like this, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm worried beforehand whether people will show up, whether it will be good, you know, whether I'll make a fool of myself, say something stupid, etc. And like all those layers of reflexivity are uh, operative, you know, in, in, my, in my psyche uh, coming into it. Uh, and, you know, the awkwardness of dealing with screens and keyboards and crap, you know, exacerbates uh, the, those dynamics. But um, I do want to express appreciation for you all being here and for, you know, week after week uh, continuing the conversation because I think it's important. Like, um, for me, it's urgent uh, that, that we do this kind of work, not necessarily us specifically now, you know, in a world important way, but that this, that, that we kind of, that we hold a clear, that clearing, that interfacial and that uh, interontological or whatever, that the intersubjective clearing. Uh, to me, that's a really important thing to be doing. And it's, you know, I feel pretty clumsy in the way that we're sort of handling all this because it's, it's, uh, it's you know, a d- unstable, pl- you know, we're dealing with unstable platforms overall. Uh, and we just haven't done it. Uh, very much. I don't think we know how that well. So we're learning. Um, but but I, I, I do appreciate you all being here. And, and I really want to thank you all. Uh, so, and, and, you know, we're only three, two chapters into this, too. So ways to go. So I, I, I uh, hope we'll, we'll stick, stick it through. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Marco. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. I hope enjoyed that. And a lot of fun. <laughs> Good. Good. All right. Well, two weeks from now. Same bat okay. channel, same bat station. Okay. We'll same. give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.